I want to really thank everyone for being here. And it's, we're a small group tonight, but that's very important to us that you're here. Um, for, we really appreciate your support, and, and we're going to talk about, uh, hopefully get you really enthusiastic and, and excited about the composting program. We think the environmental benefits from the composting program are really big and numerous. And we're really excited about soil health. And if you guys feel that same way, then, then you can help other people in San Francisco also feel the vibe. And so we can get more and more stuff into that compost bin and, and do improve that soil health on more and more farms and really help our environment and our climate. Um, I work, I'm the spokesperson for Recology, which is your recycling and composting company here in San Francisco. It's an employee-owned company. So on recycling, we have a funny saying down there where we're sorting out your bottles and cans. We like to say, life's a mess and we sort it out. <laughs> but tonight we're going to talk mostly about composting. And uh, this is the 20th anniversary of the compost program starting, composting collection program starting here in San Francisco. And it's a real game changer because uh, it's keeping materials out of landfills and it's returning uh, nutrients to the soil and it's giving farmers an alternative to using chemical fertilizers and it's helping save water and there's other things too. This is, this is one of my favorite places in San Francisco, by the way. Uh, it's um, Fort Funston and it's a beach just to the west and south of here and this is at low tide and I encourage you all to go there at low tide. And this is an example of the kinds of places we're trying to protect and what we'd, what, what we'd like to have. Um, oops. This is another beach. So if we don't do right by the environment, this is what can happen. This is a vineyard and there's a whole lot of photosynthesis going on here and we want to see a lot more of that. That's much better than sending stuff to a landfill. We don't need much of that. And we've got too much of that going on in this country and in the world, and also a lot of incineration. Um, here's a picture of um, the three bins now, how far we've come. So now uh, property management companies are trying to get them into public spaces and do it in really elegant ways. And so uh, like Jack Macy from the city here, Jack is a leader in the compost program, and he's done a lot of things so that every property in San Francisco is participating in the compost program. Um, here's a picture of our finished compost. The, the pieces are nice and small, and so our compost is more developed than in other uh, places around the world. Um, here's an older picture of our compost facility uh, in, near Vacaville. It shows this was an older picture when we started with Nigel, and we were using a tarp system at that point. We don't use tarps anymore. We use BioCape now, and we've made other improvements. This is a picture in the middle of that, that facility. And here's a picture of, of when the compost is a little further along. This machine is called a windrow turner. And so there's lots of microorganisms in that long row of compost. And like Nigel, and Diana will tell you, this is essentially a microbe farm. We, we, there's billions upon billions of microorganisms in those piles. And they, just like us, they need water and they need air. So that's what this machine is doing. It's turning them and it's adding some water. And this is our blending pad at the end. And so we, we make special blends. We have other soil amendments that we blend together with the immature compost. And then we send it off to the farms. Here's a vineyard, and they're broadcasting it across the vineyard. Um, I guess I'm a little, okay, here, here um, is after they've picked the grapes, and then they're growing a cover crop in this hallway between the rows of vines. This hallway is eight feet or two meters wide. And, and, uh, and here, then, you know, in, come this time of year in April, then those cover crops are, like this one's mustard, they're very big. And Nigel commented a little earlier that, that a, lot, a lot of the vineyards, most, almost all the vineyards are doing this now. Um, I can't show you a picture, picture of carbon in the atmosphere, but I can show you a picture of plants that pull carbon out of the atmosphere. So here it is. 
um, a year ago, on a Sunday night at 8 o'clock, the vineyard farm managers called me and they said, you have to come tomorrow because the cover crops are peaking and we want you to photograph them. So I went and I took this picture. It looks kind of like a Monet painting. It's hard to tell that that's a vineyard, but you can, if you look closely, you can see the vine. You can see the different types of cover crops there, and you can just see the life and the diversity and you can imagine the bees that were there and, and the worms and the snakes and the, and, and the other creatures, uh, the biodiversity that is happening there. Like, like Nigel is saying, this is how far you, we can take it. And this is what we need to do a lot more of. And as Diana said, it's not just what you see above the soil. There's all kinds of life. There's a life web in the topsoil that we can't see, but it's there. And so when we do these types of things, that's what happens. This is Chateau Monsalina. They've been using our compost for a long time. That's Dave Vela, the vineyard manager. And he had the tallest mustard crop this year that he's ever had. And he's, this, this man is six feet one or six feet two. So you can imagine how tall that mustard is. Um, those are the roots. And so when that plant dies, those, those roots die and they become food for the animals and the microorganisms in the soil. They can eat them and then make the nutrients more available to the roots of the plants. There's a, there's a good one, Nigel. <laughs> a long time. Remember that? Now look at, now it's not, just, it's not just the beautiful heirloom tomatoes, but look at the health of his plants. I mean, they're really healthy. That's what a lot of times I'm told farmers look at is the, is the plants. These are some big ones that K pay fruits and vegetables. But again, look at the plants. Look at the health of the plants. Look at this, these are table grapes. Look at the weight of that. Of that. And they use compost in, to help get there. This is, a, um, again, Chateau Montalina, and there's two different cover crops here. This is rye and barley and, and, and oats. And this is a cover crop that attracts beneficial insects. So they, they want to attract insects that will then eat pests that are a threat to their vines. Look at the leaf on that plant. When you have healthy soil, you can grow healthy plants, and then you don't need uh, pesticides to chase bugs away because the plant. And look at the look at the stem leading down into the uh, the grapes, the supple purple stem. It's like the veins in your wrist. Okay, that's because of healthy soil. Um, and here's uh, another picture. Um, you can see their soil. This is the day before they pick the grapes, but look at the size of that leaf. That's an enormous leaf. It's the biggest leaf I've ever seen on a, on a grapevine for wine plants. And with that large leaf, it can do a lot of photosynthesis. Also, compost saves a tremendous amount of water. A good quality compost by weight is 50% humus. And humus is a natural sponge. It both attracts and retains water. So you can imagine, if we do this, all those regions around the world that Diana was showing on her map, we can help them survive droughts. We can help them survive the double whammy of, of drought and higher temperature, which can kill soils. So here's from our compost giveaway. Here we're using it in Golden Gate Park. So a lot of this compost comes back to the city. And here are our bins. And I'm going to end it there. I just want to encourage everyone to put all their coffee grounds and all their eggshells and all their food soiled paper Anything that we can compost, please put it in that green bin, and then we can make compost and help these fine people do the good work that they do. We can do a very brief Q&A. What, what, who's got a question? Who can kick us off with a question? Rangelands, one application of compost creates this system, systemic change that just continues for year after year without doing compost again. Well, we always used to think of compost as providing nutrients for the soil. So we'd take, you know, I would send the vegetables to the city, people would put them in the, in the food bin, in the green bin, and then we'd make the compost 
um, over in Vacaville, and then we'd kind of return the nutrients to the soil. But what has really changed since the year 2000 is our understanding of soil and the role of microorganisms and the biology of the soil. So we no longer, I no longer think of the compost that Jepson Prairie produces from the food waste in San Francisco as really returning nutrients. I think of it in terms of this is this amazing material that you can put on all the fields around the whole Bay Area, Bay Area and really bring those soil back, back to life so that we can use the natural biological processes and techniques that we've learned with cover crops and everything to enliven those soils so we can bring the nutrients from the from the, uh, release them from the soil and, and photosynthesis and sequester carbon. So it's like thinking of compost as a different thing. You know, what, what San Francisco is producing is uh, this magical stuff that farmers can use to enliven and re-enliven their soils. And once they're alive, then they're alive. Yeah, and so I no longer have to keep having truckloads of compost come to my farm because we've got it going, okay? Maybe sometime I need to add a bit more or something like that, but now another farmer can do it. You know... It really depends on how depleted the soils are, I suppose. I mean, what, in your mind now, do you think, like, how many applications would it take? And it probably depends, again, on the health of the soils. Well, yes, every, every soil is different. I, and um, that's the skill of the farmer and the agronomist and people involved in determining a program for your particular soil. There are many, many different soils. I happen to have a pretty good soil. Um, but it's still taken me and all the, all the teaching of other farmers a long time to work all this out. Um, and we have a lot of very smart people involved in this. So it can be done. It depends on each different soil, uh, the techniques and the time and how much. But it's good that I give my allotment of compost up so somebody else can use it. I mean, there's still a huge demand for the compost. Yeah. Everything, everything goes out the facility. Nothing gets wasted. We can't meet the demand. Right, exactly. So as soon as I can give it up, as soon as a farmer can say, OK, my soil's great, OK? Next farmer can work on this. That's really great. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. Um, I, think it's a, I think it's a success story, a story to actually stop using the compost. So he's created a, a closed loop system. Yes. So it's kind of like in, in a functioning ecosystem in a forest or something, there's nobody going out and applying compost. It's just nature regulates it and it works. So now that he's you know, tinkered with it and jump-started the, the microbiology, it's working. So he's able to keep it, not bring inputs from elsewhere. Sir, so you had a question? Congratulations. Yes. Uh, do you still plow? Do I still plow? Plow. Uh, no, no, I don't plow anymore. Um, yeah, well, what, what you do when you cultivate soil is you oxidize soil and you release carbon, okay, into the atmosphere, okay? What we want to do is to minimize that, okay? So we want to disturb soil as least amount as possible because also in, under the ground it, it uh, disturbs all the uh, soil life. Now, I do cultivate my soil, but I only cultivate enough and only deep enough so that I can actually put a plant in the soil. You know, so I'm not, uh, I'm not ripping it really, really deeply. I'm, not, I'm just cultivating that top three or four inches so that I can sow my seeds, I can easily get my seeds in the ground, I can come along and, you know, we have a little machine that helps us transplant and, and then we cultivate any weeds. So um, we don't turn soil over 12 inches deep every year or rip it just because it's Wednesday. Uh, we do it very purposefully and very minimally and there's still a lot of improvements. A winter that goes over the soil is, is not valid? I believe it is not valid. Yes, I really believe 
There are a lot of farmers in the Midwest, a lot of big farmers and huge acreages in the Midwest where they're doing what they call no-till farming. Now, some of them are using uh, herbicides to do that. Some of them are doing it organically. And some of them are doing a little bit of both. So, you know, it's, there's a lot of work being done on very big scale farming, you know, uh, huge areas to develop this. And I think rather than, you know, the, it's, it's, it's a work in progress. If the, if the, sorry. Yeah. Oh, if the topic is of interest to you, there's a great book I'd recommend called Dirt, the Erosion of Civilization by David Montgomery, who's a professor of uh, geology at the University of Washington, and he goes through and systematically looks at all these different civilizations that ultimately collapsed. And his thesis is that by overplowing, they made themselves vulnerable to, um, you know, attacks from the outside or when there was a drought or something. Um, and the one exception that he finds is the Egyptians, because of the Nile, the Nile replenished the fertility on an annual basis, so that civilization was able to continue for thousands of years uninterrupted, whereas all these other civilizations kept just disappearing or collapsing. So um, yes, the, 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 the new wisdom is that plowing is actually quite detrimental, and there are all sorts of um, ways to get around it. You were talking about the cover cropping, and you can just now go through and, and squash the plant down, but leave the stock there, and then come through with um, these, you know the name of them, I can't remember the name of it right now, but these um, drills that will just go straight down into the soil and plant the seed without all the tillage. Yes? So to follow up on that, you're talking about tilling the three or four inches of soil. Are you called that, do you consider that no-till, or is that still mm -hmm. tilling? Um, well, there's various different types of no-till. I mean, I think for a farmer, when you're planting a crop, you have to look at your particular situation and minimize the soil disturbance. And that's really all that you're really doing. And now people are trying different techniques as to how to achieve. You know, I, I, my job is to, at the end of the day, harvest the lettuce or harvest strawberries. So I have to get the crop into the ground. I have to protect it and from weeds and, 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 and allow it to grow and, th and flourish on my farm. So we've been all the time experimenting with different ways of doing that. And so each farmer, whether they're growing uh, corn or watermelons or chickens and producing eggs, they have to find different ways to get the plant into the ground or to use perennial crops, or so it, it's it's a it, and it also depends on your climate and, and what particular soil you have. So, I'm not going to say that you shouldn't plow or should only do no-till or you should only do this or not do that. Uh, farmers are very skilled at getting their crops in the ground and bringing them to your table, and that's really what we're trying to do. And I think if we have applied the same amount of skill and knowledge to that has been applied to lots and lots of chemicals and making money out of uh, the kind of scorched earth farming that we've been doing, we would be a long way towards solving a lot of those problems. And I believe that there are many farmers in this country and all over the world who are getting a long way on that. But there's still, I mean, you, this might sound a little crazy, but I believe I'm maybe 25% of the way on this journey. And I'm being very serious there, because I am hoping one day to have my farm into a complete diverse cover crop, perennial plants, that we just make a little slice in the soil, and we plant the seeds we need, you know, looking for that, and we just grow the crops and harvest, and then we come along with, with maybe a tractor and a mower to clean everything up, or animals come along and eat, and then we plant another crop through that soil that will use a lot less water because the ground will be completely covered all the time. Uh, it will absorb all the rainwater because, you know, we talk about reservoirs and saving water and what's the level of this lake or that lake. We really need to soak in everything that falls on the, on the fields. You know, I don't want to see brown soil and water coming into the bay. 
you know, okay, we've got a tremendous year, all the water comes in the bay, the bay turns brown. We don't want that. We want the soil to stay in the fields, in the mountains, and rehydrate the landscape. If we rehydrate the landscape, then the plants can take the water as they need it with the roots down deep level, a deep level. And we can all flourish. Which is another um, argument for not plowing, because when you plow, you destroy the aggregation, the soil structure, and so when it does rain, it's harder for the water to infiltrate and go down deep where it's supposed to go. And so now we see with climate change this oscillation between drought and then flood. And the reason we get the flooding is because when the soil, I mean, when it does rain, the water doesn't percolate down into the soil, it just runs off and sheets off because of the aggregation is, is missing. Um, more, clay. more clay. More clay, too. I, have, I, I wish you would have a comment on the soil into double digging, because many people do that in cities for urban farming, but you are talking about large-scale agriculture. You are not talking like urban farming. And in the cities, we do the double digging to prepare the soil when it's too... Yeah, I mean, the, the, you, know? you know, I mean, there are many ways to do this. I mean, you have a situation in an urban environment where you don't have huge amounts of water rushing down of a hill or in a field to wash the soil away. I mean, um, there are people who are doing gardening in cities who are doing it without digging, no dig farming. Okay, there are people who are double digging. There are sometimes, I mean, I, I do um, every 10 or 11 years, um, because I use tractors on my farm, I do come along and I, I do cultivate gently at depth because I don't want you know, the compaction of the, of the tractors and things like that. So I, I would like not to say you know, no dig or, or uh, all of those different techniques. We're not saying they're wrong. We're saying what you do as a farmer or as a gardener in the city, you look at your soil, you think about biology, you think about soaking up all the water, and you use the appropriate techniques. So I'm not saying any of that double digging is wrong. But there, you look around and see what people are doing in your neighborhood with your soil and how they're handling your soil and how they're, who's achieving really good results and learn, you know? It's, um, it's not about my way or the highway. <laughs> it's about bringing the soil back to life and producing fabulous food without lots of chemicals out of a bag that is just pouring money into corporate America. Does that make sense? Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, it sounds a little bit like regenerative agriculture, right? What you're doing right now would be on the lines of going towards regenerative agriculture. Well, there's lots of names, and I try to avoid all those names. I try to even use avoid using the organic word. I, tried, I think most people can understand, you know, the bio biology of the soil, the biology of the gut, um, bringing things back to life and not just, not just taking a pill or, you know, feeding your soils like they have a disease or plants. So, yes, there's lots of names. As sustain I mean, these names just get... I see trucks driving up the, up the freeway with sustainable... Uh, produce chickens, right? And those chickens, what they're produced in a factory in Petaluma. I don't think there's anything, anything sustainable about chickens that are produced in a factory. We need to get animals back onto the farm. We need to get people back onto the farm. We need to get children smelling soil, getting them tasting food, and people cooking in their kitchens. You know, and really absolutely getting excited about um, feeding themselves and not just um, nipping into a store to get a quick burger or, or a frozen meal or something like that. Or deli food. Yeah. Something in plastic. Or something that's, that's had to have a lot of preservatives added to it because it doesn't last very long. We want. We want micro, micro pollen says we want food that's rotting, you know. We want to we want to get to eat it, and and uh, like our strawberries, we always pick our strawberries as ripe as we dare, and we always get in trouble 
with the people we sell them to or the customers because, you know, sometimes they get a little smushed or something like that, but boy, they taste good. And that's when they've got all the nutrients, when things are actually really ripe. And that's what the science is telling us now. An underripe fruit, underripe vegetables do not have the same health-giving nutrients and nutrition than something that's underripe. We've got to have it ripe. So, <laughs> thank you. Yes. Thank you. I think um, I heard Joel Salatin speak over the weekend, and one thing that stuck with me is he said that we want to move from. Um, you know, a capital intensive model to a knowledge intensive model. And I think that that's something that, that you were sort of alluding to is that the, a lot of these techniques, they require good management and a lot of thinking and just not just pouring chemicals, you know, just a cocktail that you just walk away from and come back six months later and harvest. It's really, you know, what, what's going on, reading the landscape, what's going on in my farm, what's going on with my soil health, what's the weather look like? And so there's so many variables that you really need to consider that, that, that you want it to be less prescriptive so that it can be adaptive. I think you have the microphone. Yes. I do. I have a question for you that's going to kind of take this in a different direction. And my question is about compostable plastics. So compostable plastics are obviously really popular in San Francisco. People like to have their cake and eat it too. So have something that's convenient and um, disposable, but also doesn't add to the landfill. And not too long ago, I was at Jepson Prairie, and I saw a lot of these compostable plastics that were not breaking down quickly enough to become part of the compost. And so I'm interested in your view on this. Like, are, is there such a thing as a truly compostable plastic? And is that a viable option? Oh, I think there's, two, there's a two-part answer to this. Um, and I'll do the first, fir first part, sorry. I'll do the first part. And I'd like to ask Jack Macy to do the second part, OK? <laughs> because he's done a lot of study on this. But I can tell you, um, uh, this whole field of compostable cups and compostable bags and cutlery, it's a relatively uh, young field. Um, and some of these things compost well, and some of them not so well. Um, Jack has helped create a standard. And so if it says compostable, you know, and, and you'll see some of the bags, and it says there's a nice big word in all capital letters, compostable. Those ones compost pretty well. There's other ones that go through the process, and then they get lifted out by this, the screens at the end of the process, and you and I could use them, wash them, and use them to eat soup, like a spoon. Uh, so when I, you use the term compostable plastics, and when I hear that, I hear the word plastic. And... Um, uh, and that, uh, like bioplastics, you know, they, they, they have some plastic elements in them, so they don't break down very well. So uh, we certainly understand the need to have, that people need to have things like a liner bag, or if they're having a picnic, they'd like to have something that they can either reuse or it can truly compost. So we support uh, these types of things. Um, but they need to be truly compostable. They need to be not made from plastic, but be made from plant material. Um, uh, I would recommend, we would recommend that people try to use real plates and real silverware and real cups whenever possible and make the effort to, you know, put them in a canvas sack and bring them on a picnic and, and just not by um, single-use materials. Um, and we really believe that, even though we're part of our business is collecting and transporting stuff. We really believe that, that people ought to reuse uh, metal and glass and, and try to get away from these things. And I'll let Jack um, give you a better answer than I can, because he's really, literally the expert. Well, I uh, like your, your reuse answer. So reusing is always better than any disposable. 
Um, there's a lot of confusion around compostable plastics. So uh, there is a scientific standard, an ASTM, which is a sort of uh, organization that's helped create standards. And um, so we only will consider a plastic to be compostable if it has met that standard. And the way we know that it's met that standard is that it meets a third party certification for that standard. And we were able to get a law passed in California that you can't label any plastic compostable unless they've actually met that standard. Now, verifying that can be a challenge. Uh, we actually are trying to get, um, you know, the plastics to be labeled with the certification logo, uh, or at least the you know the packaging. But that's uh, that's helped, and you know, particularly with cutlery, there's been, there's been a lot of there's a lot of history of misleading marketing where people say, oh, it's made from plants, or it's degradable, or biodegradable. And if you see that language and you don't see the word compostable, assume it's not. And only, unless you see the word compostable, that you should assume it's not. And then if you actually see the word compostable on a piece of cutlery or a cup, then I think chances are they're actually following the law because there has been some you know, en enforcement on that. And if they do meet that standard, you know, it's a lab standard, but it basically verifies that the material will fully biodegrade, uh, generally in the time that commercial composting facilities operate. But they, over time, commercial composting facilities, like ecologies, have moved to shorten the time to make it efficient. If you can do it faster, it's less costly. So, you know, I know that there are some facilities not, not so much of a problem at Recology. So most of that plastic you're seeing is not compostable. I think every once in a while, if somebody takes a compostable bag, which if it's certified compostable, will break down fairly quickly. But if they tie that bag in a knot and suddenly you have like a whole bunch of layers crammed together, then that part of the bag might not break down. <laughs> or you see green plastic, and there's a lot of green plastic bags that are not compostable out there. And then with cutlery, it's been a really big problem where a lot of, cu most of the cutlery out there for quite some time that people thought were compostable was not. And there were companies that were just really misleading. And I think that's gotten you know better now. There are certain companies that sell compostable cutlery, like with a teardrop you know, uh, cut, cut through, like world-centric. Uh, so just make sure it says compostable. But if you can avoid using disposable, that's, that's even better. Okay, well, um, I think we're out of time. Oh, we have another, one more question. Go ahead. So this is a, an endorsement. I want to thank Diana Dono for the World Certificate Zone. She is the only person of Center for Food Safety was the only organization during the COP21 presenting about souls. And, and after that, now in any climate talks in, in, in the world, they're going to talk about salt in the future thanks to these videos that they, made, that they made. And she's organizing a conference in August that is called Soil Not Oil. And I don't know if she wanna talk about it. <laughs> well, you, I'm helping you organize the conference. Um, so that's Miguel Robles with the Biosafety Alliance and Miguel put together this Soil Not Oil conference last um, year in Richmond. And he's going to do it again this year. And I said that I would be happy to help organize the soil plenary. Um, but there's a lot more that happens at this conference besides soil. So I would encourage you all to go on the soilnotoil.org website. Look at the dates. They're August 5th and 6th. Um, yeah, it's a great conference. It brings together many speakers on a, lot, a broad range of topics. I can pass it around. Yeah, and I want to encourage you to uh, get as many people out in the garden as possible. Yeah? Get as many people touching soil as possible. The, and people in San Francisco can use this compost, too, to enliven their own gardens and grow food in the city. You know? Actually, it's, it's really good what you say. I always, when I, I go to present to a place and I talk about food justice, there is no food justice if you don't try to grow your own food. And I teach classes, I facilitate yeah. workshops on, on urban farming. I have a, a presentation, the 28, that is called Urban Farming and Climate Change, because it's something that can be really helpful. And, it's the, and this is a long discussion. I hope you can join. You, I hope you can come to the conference and speak during the conference, share your experience with other farmers and, 
yeah. the public. There is all kind of people in this conference. Last year we have 1,000 people. It's a big conference. And we're going to talk about it, and I encourage you to, to yeah. come. If you don't have money, we have opportunities for to volunteer, you know, for low income. Thank you. Yeah, let's, um, let's not criticize other people who are gardening or their particular technique. It's getting, as, getting your hands in the dirt, getting as many people connected with food, and we can all then learn from each other. Okay? Thank you all very much. I Thank really you. appreciate this. Thanks for coming. Thank good questions. Thank you very much. Audience Thank you to the library for hosting. Yeah, thank you.